once again Christian greetings to all our valued listeners and viewers throughout the whole world even more particularly to all shepherds rod believers and most especially to our beloved brothers and sisters in the United States of America. Special greetings to our brethren in Colorado and Kansas in Georgia and Missouri in Texas in Chicago, Illinois and Arkansas in California in New York in Fiji Island in Mexico, Spain in Africa, Zambia, Kenya, Pakistan to the United Kingdom to our brethren in Australia and also to our brethren in Malaysia and to the rest of the 144,000 living saints scattered abroad. Greetings. May the good Lord bless you, brothers and sisters. This is our day 10, the last day just prior to the last and the great final day of atonement in the holy place as the cleansing of the sanctuary. So, welcome to all our brethren who are listening and viewing this program. Now, I would like to read track number Track number five. It says here in track number five, page 102. It is concerning Revelation 10, verse 11. Revelation 10, verse 11. And he said unto me, Thou must prophesy again before many peoples and nations and tongues and kings. Revelation 10, verse 11. Track number five, page 102. It says, to correct their misunderstanding, on Daniel 8.14, the prophetic word of God declared, Thou must prophesy again, that is, repeat the preaching of Christ coming to earth. So the statement is very clear. Repeat the preaching of Christ coming to earth. First of all, the particular object in view is concerning many peoples, many nations, and tongues, and kings. So... That statement alone indicates clearly that that coming of Christ cannot be the visible coming because the visible coming of Jesus Christ will be preached to all nations and to all peoples. Now, let us read again track number 5, 105 to find out who are they, the many people and many nations. It says here, the trumpet symbolism has now brought us up to the time of the ingathering of the first fruits, the 144,000. First fruits predicate second fruits, for it is necessarily true that there can be no first where there is no second. Wherefore, just as there is a prophetic commission for the ingathering of the first fruits from many nations, so there must be one for the ingathering of the second fruits from all nations. So here the shepherd's rod plainly told us that the many nations referred to the 144,000 living saints. The all nations refer to the great multitude which no man could number. So Revelation 10 verse 11 is directly addressed to the 144,000 living saints. And this coming of Christ in track number 502 cannot be the visible coming of Jesus Christ. But rather, it is the invisible coming of Jesus Christ to purify the sons of Levi, to purify the ministry. Now, let us read again the statement on 1SR Packet Edition on page 19. 1SR Packet Edition, page 19 and page 20. It says, Furthermore, the query, shall he find faith on the earth, is not questioning the number of saints at this particular coming, but rather faith itself regardless of number. And if at his appearing in the clouds to take home the faithful, he finds no faith in the earth, then what about his waiting church, which is to be without spot or wrinkle or any such thing, be it small or great? Obviously, his coming recorded in Luke 18 verse 8 cannot be the one of 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 verse 17. His coming in the clouds, but it could be the one of Malachi 3 verse 2 and 3. And Matthew 13, verse 30, 47 to 48, leading to Matthew 25, verse 31 to 33. He's coming to his temple 
is to separate the sinners from the saints at the commencement of which time inspirations us who may abide the day of his coming so the coming mentioned in luke 8 and verse 8 the mere fact that jesus christ is asking the question shall he find faith on the earth and the jerbers run says that in that coming god is not asking the number of saints but rather god is asking faith regardless of number first of all i would like to read lessons on faith to define faith itself so let's read um how the the voice of inspiration defined the word the word faith and faith is cometh by hearing hearing the word of god I think that is in romans chapter 10 on verse 15 so here in um lessons on faith on page uh, where's that state that faith cometh by hearing and hearing the word of god therefore if there is no word of god then there can be no faith so here in lessons on faith pages 34 and 35 it says faith is complete dependence upon the word of god upon the word of god only for the accomplishment of what that word says this being so it must never for a moment be forgotten that where there is no word of god there cannot be any faith he says this is shown also in the truth that faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of god romans 10 verse 17 since faith thus comes indeed by the very word of god itself it is perfectly plain that where there is no word of god there can be no faith so faith that is complete dependence of what the word of god says so if there is no word of god then there can be no faith but if there is a word of god then there are only two things whether you will cultivate faith or whether you will cherish doubts here on um, christ and his righteousness on page 74 it says christ and his righteousness page 74 by ag wagoner it says surely all doubt as to acceptance with god ought to be set at rest page 74 christ and his righteousness surely all doubt as to acceptance with god ought to be set at rest but it is not the evil heart of unbelief still suggests doubts I believe all this, but there stop right there. If you believe, you wouldn't say but. When people add but to the statement that they believe, they really mean, I believe, but I don't believe. Christ and his righteousness, page 74. Therefore, if you say you believe, but there added the word but, the bottom line, the truth of the matter is that, that is hypocrisy. You don't believe because to believe is to cast all doubts. There will be no word but. If you will say, I believe but, then the reality is that you don't, you don't believe. Now, I would like to read in answerer number two on page 68. Let's read the statement. Answerer number two, page 68. Viewing the question in the light of both statements, we see that Christ leaves the sanctuary at a certain time in the unruling of the scroll. Coming to the church, he finds her not spotless and ready to meet him, but deep in sin, yet self-complacently feeding upon the errors, faults, and mistakes of others. So, hoping, uh, brethren, that we will not be among these people that even at the time when jesus christ was already on the earth they still continue feeding upon the errors faults and mistakes of others and the most disheartening is that according to 2 tg 46 page 48 2 tg 46 page 48 it says loose and rattling tongues will endeavor to shake the faith of us all 2 tg 46 page 48 loose and rattling tongues will endeavor to shake the faith of us all the ones though who bear the heaviest burden of feeding the flock 
with meat in due season will be the devil's main targets. And at just such a time as this, these devoted followers of God will profit most by the Lord's advice. Trust ye not in a friend, put ye not confidence in a guide. Keep the doors of thy mouth from her that lieth in thy bosom. For the son dishonoreth the father, the daughter rise against her mother, the daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. A man's enemies are the men of his own house. Therefore I will look unto the Lord. I will wait for the God of my salvation. My God will hear me. 2TG 46 on page 48. I would like to read this reading. In track number one on page 24. Track number one on page 24. It says here, uh, let's read. I would like to begin on page 23. Criticizing and fault finding. Track number one, page 23 and page 24. Criticizing and fault finding. They will question and criticize everything, says the spirit of prophecy, in poor warning of the purification that arises in the unfolding of truth. Criticize the work and position of others. Criticize every branch of the work in which they have not themselves a part. They will feed upon the errors and mistakes and faults of others. Until, say the angel, the Lord Jesus shall rise up from his mediatorial work in the heavenly sanctuary and shall clothe himself with the garments of vengeance and surprise them their unholy feast. And they will find themselves unprepared for the marriage supper of the Lamb. Testimonies, volume 5, page 690. Then it says in track number 1, page 24, These solemn words may its lay well to heart and may none let the enemy beguile them with good words and fair speeches on this life and death matter. Fix in your mind the fact that Christ rising up from his mediatorial work cannot be after probation has closed. For note carefully, he is to rise up during the unfolding of truth. Let it take heed that he fall not to criticize the message or the messengers, but rather that he sigh and cry as the Lord bids for all the abominations that be done in the midst of the church, lest he be found on the wrong side, reigns with the evil doers, and thus doomed to fall under the angels, is louder weapons. Trap number one on page 23 and page 24. So that visitation of Jesus Christ on this earth is very solemn because if we will place ourselves on the wrong side, brothers and sisters, then we are dooming our own self. Now, I would like to read again that statement in 2SR on page 242. It says, It would have been unreasonable and an injustice to the chosen people of God if He should have left them in darkness. Concerning the time of the most important event of all church history, the coming of Christ. And to repeat again, that coming cannot be the visible coming. That is Christ coming to the most holy place and then visits this earth. Here in 11 Symbolical, number 12 on page 7, it says here, 11 Symbolical, number 12, page 7 and page 8, if no one is to know the day and hour until the Lord comes, then how could this servant be aware of the day and the hour? Do you see that one statement seems to contradict the other? No one knows the hour, the day. Therefore, God's people must be ready for the event to occur at almost any time. And if this servant does not faithfully perform his duties, then when the Lord is about to come, that servant will not be aware of it. Is that not how you understand these two statements? Up to a certain time, God's people do not know the day and the hour. But if they continue to receive meat in due season, a day will come when this servant is going to be made aware of that hour of that day. 11 Symbolic Code, number 12, page 7 and page 8. Here in Answerer number 2, on page 23, Answerer number 2, page 23 and page 24, is this, 
Indeed, do the scriptures do say that even the angels know not the hour? Yet, if they are ever to be ready to start out with the Lord upon His second advent, certainly they must someday beforehand be told of it in order to make ready and to start out. And although no man now knows the day or hour, yet if the Father sees fit to declare it, we cannot but know it. Page 24, it says, Moreover, this secret coming, so this coming is called secret coming, meaning very seldom, very few know it, this visitation. Moreover, this secret coming, Matthew 24, verse 36, may be another than that commonly understood as the second coming. So this secret coming, which is commonly understood as the second coming, yes, that is correct. That is the second coming of Christ, but not the visible. That is the second invisible coming of Jesus Christ. That according to the voice of inspiration, if no one will know, then Jesus Christ will come to this earth without any faith at all. But it is impossible. The mere fact that Jesus Christ himself emphasized in Luke 18 verse 8 that at that coming shall Christ find faith on earth. The shepherd's rod plainly told us in 1SR Packet Edition, page 19, that in that particular coming of Jesus Christ, he is not asking how many number of people, but rather faith itself regardless of numbers. Faith itself, brothers and sisters. And blessed are those people by which when Jesus Christ will arrive, they will find uh, welcome our loving Savior, brothers and sisters. I remember the statement it says, it was written by William Miller in 1842. If a man love Christ, he will love his appearing. If he hate him, he will hate to see him come. This rule cannot be broken. So I would like to read again. If a man love Christ, he will love his appearing. If he hate him, he will hate to see him come. This rule cannot be broken. Now, I would like to read this reading. I think this was written by um, Alonso Jones. It says, Men were not then compelled to believe. It says, Men were not then compelled to believe. But eight believing souls were saved, while all the world beside sunk in their unbelief beneath the waters of the flood. God has never revealed his truth to men in a manner to compel him to believe. Those who have wished to doubt his word have found a wide field in which to doubt and a broad road to perdition. Only those who wish to believe find solid rock on which to to rest their faith when the son of man cometh shall he fight shall he find faith on the earth luke 18 verse 8 he will find but little he will find but little you see brothers and sisters and it says it will be as in the days of noah a few will believe and stand complete in god amid all the perils of the last days fear not little flock for it is your father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. Hoping that we will be among that little flock. I would like to read words to the little flock. These words is addressed to the little flock. The, the booklet itself, words to the little flock. So these words is addressed to the little flock. So let's read in page 4. Page 5. Will not the day and hour of Jesus appearing be made known by the voice of the eternal God? That the day and hour will be known by the true children of God. So let's, let's read again the statement. It says, That the day and hour will be known by the true children of God, and no others appears plain from the fact that we are exhorted to watch for it. And if we do not watch, Jesus will come on us as a thief, and we shall not know what hour he will come upon us. So that none but those who truly watch and hold fast will know the true time. Revelation 3 verse 2 and verse, verse 3. I love so much this um, statement saying, I think it was written by Joshua Hines. 
how how important it is that we should meditate on his coming that it should be the subject of our nightly prayer the burden of morning thoughts and the theme of our noonday consideration it should occupy our sleeping and our waking hours how solemn the thought that the lord cometh those words shall be in our hearts continually and we should teach them diligently to our children we should fall of them when we sit in the house and when we walk by the way when we lie down and when we rise up and when we are about our daily occupation we should bind them for a sign upon our hand and a frontlet between our eyes and write them on the tablet of our hearts we should engrave them on the posts of our houses and on our gates and say to all continually the lord cometh he cometh as a refiner's fire and as fuller's soap and who shall stand when he appeareth i would like to read um, this reading on 1sr let us read 1sr page 151 it says 1sr page 151 while god will come with vengeance to some he comes with salvation to others verse 20 It says, verse 20, uh, verse 20 or 1SR 151. While God will come with vengeance to some, He comes with salvation to others. Verse 20. And the Redeemer shall come to Zion. This is not referring to the second coming of Christ in the clouds. For it takes place before probation closes. He's not coming with vengeance to the ungodly in the world, but coming to the church. And when He comes, He will do the work mentioned in Malachi 3, verse 1 to 3. And that is the coming mentioned in Luke 18, verse 8, according to 1SR Packet Edition, page 19 and page 20. I would like to read track number 1. Track number 1 on page 12. Track number 1, page 12. It says, In the clear light of these facts, Chapter 9 is seen to hold the climactic scene of the vision. Track number 1, page 12. In the clear light of these facts, chapter 9 is seen to hold the climactic scene of the vision, describing the awful work which the Lord is to do when, with the cherubim, He visits the earth. Who is the cherubim? The man with the writer inkhorn by his side. By which such visitation, such purpose, is to seal the hundred for the four thousand living saints. And who are they? The saints to be sealed. Those by which there is no guile in their mouths. What does it mean? To the people by which they focus only in studying the word of God. They were not ruining the reputation of other people. They were not criticizing. They were not fault finding. Now, I would like to read again the statement here in track number 1, page 12. In the clear light of these facts, chapter 9 is seen to hold the climactic scene of the vision. So that is the climactic scene of the vision. And hoping that we are ready and placing ourselves on the right side. Describing the awful work which the Lord is to do when with the cherubim, He visits the earth. It says, it shows the fearsome consequences to those who reject its message. What message? To tell the 144,000 that the Redeemer is come to redeem us, to redeem the 144,000. And it is a fearsome consequences to those who reject its message, its blessings miss, The kingdom lost, its blessings missed. The kingdom lost, tragic, prideful experience. It shall be the faith of all who refuse now to awake and to know about it, but who choose rather to remain in ignorance of its truth and of the object of the Lord's coming in His throne. I would like to um, read the statement. And it is concerning um, Matthew 
Uh, 11 Symbolic Code number 12, page 18. It says, Now we plainly see, 11 Symbolic Code number 12, page 18. So let's read. Now we plainly see that Christ in Matthew 25 is talking about the judgment for the living. And in connection with this subject, we find that Malachi says the very same thing, namely, that after a messenger has prepared the way, the Lord will suddenly come to his temple. Suddenly come to his temple. It says to purify it, Malachi 3 verse 1. When he comes, it is not to judge the dead in the heavenly sanctuary, but to judge the living in the earthly sanctuary. And if the Lord is going to sit on his throne on earth and gather the nations before him and judge and separate the people, where specifically is the Lord going to sit? So that is the question. 11 Symbolic Code, number 12, page 18. Now here's another statement I would like to read. 11 Symbolic Code, number 12, page 11. Matthew 25, verse 1. 11 Symbolic Code, number 12, page 11. Then shall the kingdom of heaven be likened unto ten virgins, which took their lambs and went forth to meet the bridegroom. This verse begin with the word then, indicating that it takes place at the time the Lord comes as spoken of in the preceding verse. So, it says this verse begin with the word then, indicating that it takes place at the time the Lord comes as spoken of in the preceding verse. In other words, at the time the Lord comes, the kingdom shall be likened to something. The kingdom of God as a crown kingdom does not exist today as you know. Then what is meant here by the kingdom? It is referring to the people that are candidates for citizenship on it. But what citizenship? Candidates to be translated to heaven without seeing death. But half of the virgins failed failed to obtain. It says, it is referring to the people that are candidates for citizenship in it. Who are the subjects for the kingdom of God? If they are not the church, then the people comprising the church of God shall be likened unto ten virgins. So, that is very plain, brothers and sisters. The Matthew 25 verse 1, the perfect fulfillment must be at the time when Jesus Christ arrives in this earth. And here on 11 Symbolic Code number 12, page 16. 11 Symbolic Code number 12, page 16. It says, Moreover, in the parable we are studying today, did the Lord come to earth where the ten virgins were? So in this coming, the ten virgins are still in existence. I would like to read again. Moreover, in the parable we are studying today, did the Lord come to earth where the ten virgins were. Yes, he did. For he came where both the unworthy, unworthy virgins were. Who are they, the worthy virgins? They are those whose names had not been blotted out. They are those whose names had been retained in the Lamb's Book of Life. Yes, he did. For he came where both the unworthy, unworthy virgins were. If he came to earth and had a door of his own to shut or to open, that would indicate that he had a place of his own. What is that place? Church. The church recognized by Jesus Christ as his own. Then he will come to his kingdom. And unless the guests enter on time through the door, they will be disappointed when they knock and the door will not be open to them. I would like to read answerer number 2 on page 88. Answerer number 2, page 88. Bringing into Prophetic focus, the same event. Jesus declared parabolically, a certain nobleman went into a far country to receive for himself a kingdom and to return. Luke 19 verse 12. Note that he receives the kingdom, acquires ownership of it while he is away, not when he returns. Of course, the kingdom mentioned here is the kingdom church. The shepherd's rod is plainly telling us that at that time, when Jesus Christ will enter to the most holy place, there must be a church on earth by which Jesus Christ acquires ownership of it. And of course, there are the people by which Jesus Christ will come because it is illogical 
that he will come to a people by which they themselves, they did not know that he is coming. The statement in 1SR Packet Edition, page 19 and page 20 saying, Shall he find faith on earth? Indicating that Christ will come to the people by which he find faith. What is faith? Faith is believing completely the word of God. Why is it that these people obtain faith? Because they study. Because they watch. They truly watch. I remember that statement. Let me see if I could find. Saying that there are people who will say that the coming of Jesus Christ will not be known. And the answer given by inspiration, you are correct. It will not be known to the people by which they did not watch. But to the people who will watch, they will know. So that is the only reason by which the people will never know. And they will not know. It's so because they did not watch. And that is very plain. And also in the Bible. That if you will not watch, I will come on thee as a thief. So brothers and sisters, hoping that we as the Bidian, we must be the people by which we lovingly welcome the written word of God. And it is our great pleasure to study the word of God. I lost that page. So we will continue this uh, subject. This is our part one on this day 10. And just trying to emphasize the seriousness of that event. That we should not be among those people as in the days of Noah. They ridicule, love God's people. And according to the voice of inspiration, it says here, I would like to read the statement. It says, do not dream that all is well. Do not dream that all is well because you see no threatening signs of the great day. Did the inhabitants of the old world stand in fear of the flood? Yet the flood came and took them all away. So, let's read again. It says, do not dream that all is well because you see no threatening signs of the great day. Did the inhabitants of the old world stand in fear of the flood? Yet the flood came and took them all away. And even Bithihotep admonish us here in 1 TG number 12 on page 27 and page 28. You remember that while Noah was preaching that a destruction would come from the Almighty, he was also preparing a place of refuge, building the ark. Those who doubted Noah's announcement of the flood and who scoped up the idea that they should enter the ark for safety at a time when there was not even the slightest sign of threatening rain were doubters no longer when the elements of nature were unleashed. Then they madly rushed to the ark, but to their dismay and utter disappointment, they found the door tightly closed against them. Thus all, both good and bad, who choose to remain outside the ark perish. The antediluvians experience should serve as a reminder to us that we be not presumptuous as were they. We should instead take to heart the clear warning that is pertinent to this hour. For we are told that as it was in the days of the flood, so shall it be at the time of the Lord's coming. But the Lord's coming here cannot be the second visible coming. But it is the invisible coming of Jesus Christ. And we will show to you the evidences in the written word of God that this Saturday, this Saturday, at sunrise, Jesus Christ will visit the earth. May the good Lord bless you and have a wonderful, beautiful evening.